This is Dr. Jerome Corsi today. It's Thursday. It's November 2nd, 2023. Our first story I want to cover is about Israel. Uh, Israel appears determined now to destroy Hamas. We're seeing a, 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 a concerted effort to level the Gaza. So far, and, and the it's being reported on by several sources. The Wall Street Journal has a big article on it today, which is saying that uh, Israel is moving in for the uh, for a long long haul here. This is not this is not going to be simple. It's going to be a a, con- a concerted push because once Israel decides that they're going to destroy Hamas, it, it's a new calculus. This is not the way Israel has proceeded before. Israel has proceeded on limited incursions into Gaza or into Lebanon. There have been some serious attempts in Lebanon, but again, that they pulled out uh, after a little bit of time because the United States government and the world started complaining that the uh, Israelis were killing too many people, too many civilians. The problem with these incursions into Gaza is that Gaza is a, it's about, about half the size of New York City it's got 2 million people living in it. It's densely populated only in the Gaza city in the north, but that's street to street fighting. And what Israel has been doing is they, they are pledging to eliminate Hamas. And that's going to mean there's going to be civilian deaths because they're going to send rockets in to areas that are populated. So Israel says it's hit more than 11,000 targets with missiles, bombs, and artillery in in Gaza, half the area of New York City, 2 million people. That compares to 1,500 strikes the last time Israel fought Gaza militants in 2021. Now, if you remember 2021, Israel did make an effort to suppress Hamas, but the problem is Hamas now has tunnels under Gaza. They can mobilize and move around. Uh, their their forces, and Israel's going after striking some of the leaders of Hamas. But if you have a an image of Hamas to realize how densely crowded this is, it's a packed Middle Eastern city. And in a packed Middle Eastern city like this, there's no way to separate out Hamas from the civilians. And Hamas will keep the civilians into the cities largely as shields. So this is going to be a very, very difficult and costly incursion for Israel. Uh, and the world opinion is rapidly shifting in favor of Hamas. Uh, I've never seen so much support in the world. And I'm seeing various websites that are pointing out this is like an end time scenario. Uh, that, in fact, the uh, support for the terrorists, for Hamas, uh, for the Palestinians uh, is enormous. Now, if people really understood the Palestinians and really understood the nature of this movement, uh, Egypt is trying to block the Palestinians from coming into Egypt. The Gaza Strip uh, borders Egypt, and Egypt does not want these people. The people were thrown out of Jordan. The Palestinians were in Jordan. They were thrown out. They were in Lebanon. They were thrown out. They come to Israel, they've got the Gaza, and they've got uh, the West Bank. Gaza's been under the control of Hamas since 2007. I remember when Yasser, I was there the day Yasser Arafat came back into, the, into Israel and set up shop in Israel. Uh, again, he had been banned from Israel. Uh, at that time, Yasser Arafat was the leader of, he's really Muslim Brotherhood. He was born in Egypt. He's not Palestinian. Most of the Palestinians, in other words, the people who were living in this territory before the 1948 vote in the UN to partition is this is this Holy Land, a partition of Palestine to create the state of Israel. 
Okay, now, the Middle East has been in turmoil for a long time, maybe going back 2,000 years. Uh, the Romans expelled the Jews from Israel. Babylonians, they had Egyptian captivity. Uh, this has been a, a rancorous spot, and Jerusalem is sacred to three religions, sacred to uh, Christianity, to Judaism. First of all, Juda Judaism goes back you know, two millennia into Jerusalem. And if you look at the Bible, the covenant with God and Abraham was that Israel was selected for the Jews. And that has been a problem because also Muhammad, if, if you got into the uh, into the mosque up on the uh, Temple Mount, which I have been in, uh, probably could never get in there again, but there's a rock and you put your hand in this enclosure and you feel the air in there and it feels strange. That's where the Muhammad's horse's hoof print is supposedly on that rock when he leapt to heaven. And of course, Christianity was Jesus Christ having been crucified in Jerusalem. So you've got three religions that are competing over Jerusalem. And Jerusalem has a energy to it. Like it's hard to describe unless you've been there. It has a mystical feel to it. And the walls of Jerusalem are still there from Roman times. So you can basically have a city that is an ancient city that has been in constant turmoil. The Crusades, it was fought over. When the Crusades, this insanity, people leaving their homes and walking across Europe, getting indulgences from the Catholic Church on this crusade to take back the Holy Land from the Muslims. And these are insanity over human beings fighting over this little place on the earth, Jerusalem, which has gone on and will continue to go on. Now, the end result of this is hard to see because Israel Israel's determined, and I, I have been to Israel many times. I've consulted with the government. I've written three books on Iran. I wrote Atomic Iran in 2005. I wrote another book, Why Israel Can't Wait. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Israel right now is seeing an existential threat. The way this attack occurred, Israel saw the failures of the Israeli left in two ways. Number one, the Israeli population had been disarmed. The left around the world wants to take guns away from pe people, and the uh, people were vulnerable. They had no way to defend themselves against these terrorists floating in on them and surging across the border. They were, they were helpless. They could not defend themselves. A few kibbutzes that re retained weapons fought the Hamas attackers successfully. Uh, again, no weapons, no defense. That's the problem. Uh, and secondly, the idea that if, uh, if the Jews thought if they could just let Hamas run the Gaza and be authorities in West, the West Bank, that they would be reasonable and live together reasonably. But Hamas is dedicated to the destruction of Israel, and that's not going away. So they built these tunnels, they armed, and they were prepared to launch a strike that there's evidence, I believe, was coordinated by Iran, and we've been funding Iran. John Kerry, again, has been funding Iran. He's been wanting to do it since I wrote Atomic Iran. So John Kerry, at that book, uh, had been being funded as one of his big fundraisers running for president 2004 was um, this guy Namazi who was Iranian and I exposed him in the book because Namazi was funded Hillary Clinton as well and he's now in prison because he also defrauded banks to get big loans he represented himself as an investor and uh, essentially he was I think I always did think he was an agent of the mullahs, and John Kerry was happy to go along with Namazi. I believe that's Namazi's picture right there. So that you're dealing with an issue here of a long-standing hatred, and the Jews have decided they're done with it. And that's where I wrote this book, Why, Why Israel Can't Wait. I, I thought that we would come to a point where Israel would decide that the forces against it were only going to get stronger. And if Israel decides that, then it's an existential moment. 
I was with Yalon, who was number two. That's why, why Israel can't wait. I'm going to be putting some of these books up for sale again on the website. I have copies, and I'm going to sign them and get some of these books out. Uh, why Israel can't wait? Israel can't wait because the forces against it today are only going to get stronger. I was with Yalon, number two, in the government. I didn't know I was going to meet with him until I was actually sitting in his office. We talked about Ezekiel 37, 38 which is a war of Gog against Magog and sort of sounds like a nuclear war with Iran backed by Russia attacking with nuclear missiles, Israel. Israel is a one bomb state, one bomb <coughs> Hiroshima size to hit Tel Aviv, modern Jewish state as we know it is gone. And Israel knows that. So I said to you alone, and by the way, Ezekiel 37, 38 ends with God intervening and Israel wins because God intervenes. Now, I said to him, what are you going to do? He said, well, Dr. Corsi, you don't know how hard it would be, how hard do you think it would be for us to put out all the lights in the Middle East except for our own? Well, Israel did that to Gaza. They shut off the electricity, they shut off the water, they shut off the internet, and they threw Gaza into darkness. Of course, everybody screamed that was a humanitarian crisis. UN was up in arms. We've had massive demonstrations in Germany, in France, in London, in New York for Hamas. Because Hamas has done great public relations, arguing that they're oppressed by the Jews. The billions of dollars that have gone to Hamas, Yasser Arafat, for instance, when an Egyptian posing in a Muslim Brotherhood, not Hamas. A Muslim Brotherhood goes back to World War II when Hitler supported the, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt to be his force in the Middle East. And Hamas is a, a, a brotherhood organization similar to Muslim Brotherhood, but its roots are different. And, and Iran has funded Hamas, as it's funded Hezbollah in Lebanon. These are two determined groups that want to destroy Israel. So Yalon said, we will, you know, we will defend Israel regardless of what it takes, Dr. Gorsi. He said, what, whatever it takes. And he and I were talking about nuclear war. So if it came to it, Israel, I think, would not hesitate to use whatever weaponry it had at its, at its avail. And we will probably start cutting back on our aid. Certainly Biden will be pressured by the left to cut back our aid to Hamas. I mean, to Israel. There's only a limited support for Israel anymore around the world, much less than there was 25 years ago. And Israel knows it. So Israel is not going to go away without a final battle. And I mean final battle. If the world was thrown into a nuclear war and Israel caused it, Israel would defend Israel. Because the Jews know now, after the, after the Holocaust, after Hitler tried to destroy the entire Jewish race in Europe, that this was, um, they face ex existential threats. So I see a war expanding from Lebanon and Syria. We've got troops in the area. We're sending more troops in the area to defend our bases, largely in Syria. Biden abandoned Afghanistan took all those troops out, left all the equipment there. I'm sure that equipment's being used against us, the military equipment that we just left in the desert. And the Biden administration has now produced a, a massive war in Ukraine, which we're funding. And this started in 2014 when Hillary Clinton had been working with Pinochet, I put this out, an oligarch. Uh, we had the Maidan rebellion, which overthrew Yanukovych, a legitimately elected president, Russian favored in Ukraine. That's when the tensions with Russia began. Now, Putin waited and, and tried to work this out with a series of agreements, but the agreements that were made were only made for U Ukraine to arm and get ready for a war. Ukraine has probably lost most of the young men uh, that could fight and Ukraine has not won the counteroffensive. Ukraine's losing this war. And we've got two massive wars going on now with Taiwan waiting in the wings. 
Now, this is going to cause massive economic disruption because oil will quickly skyrocket in price. The World Bank is predicting it's going to go to $157 a barrel. Oil is already over $80 a barrel. And what it's going to cause is a massive economic uh, collapse. Now, I've been talking about this, and I want you to get a free copy of this book. I wrote this book, which is How the Coming Global Crash Will Create an Historic Gold Rush. And I'm seeing it now written. Uh, Peter Schiff has a good article on this today. Here's the You get a free copy of this book by calling 800-519-6268. 1-800-519-6268. Get the book, but also talk to Swiss America. That's Swiss America. I wrote the book with Dean Heskin, who is my co-author. And Dean uh, is the CEO of Swiss America. Talk to them about it. Even if you don't have lots of money, the money you put into gold right now is going to increase in value because the world currencies are all overextended. Uh, reported yesterday, we're going to raise $1.5 trillion in new treasury debt this quarter, the fourth quarter of 2023, and the first quarter of 2024. Bond rates are already up to 5%, which means that nobody is wanting this debt. And at 5%, it's costing the Fed a lot more to buy new bonds to replace and pay the interest on the old bonds. And by the way, the old bonds have now lost value if they were issued at, issued at zero or lo, close to zero coupon. In other words, they have very little interest in them, which means they'll have to be sold or valued on the portfolios at a haircut of their value. But get a copy of the book and read it. You've got to understand how desperate the situation is. We are in a world credit crisis that is a bubble, and it will burst around real estate. You're going to see it first in subprime car lending, which is going to collapse. There are going to be massive repossessions of automobiles. Then there'll be home repossessions, forfeitures, because at the interest rates at 8% are 30-year fixed mortgage. Any adjustable rate mortgage is now going to be almost unaffordable for most people in the middle class. Get a copy of the book, prepare yourself, and know what's coming. 1-800-519-6268. And last I looked earlier this morning, <clears throat> gold was in increasing in value again today and it's heading back towards $2,000 an ounce. Let's check it very quickly. Gold already at $1,998 an ounce. So it's, it's headed back up today. And I think the world knows that the, uh, the bubble that we're in is going to burst. And it's going to burst pretty soon. Okay, let's go to the next story. Uh, the um, I'm reporting extensively on uh, the wind farms. I've been pointing out that the green energy revolution is a hoax. And if we do transition to renewable fuels, we're transitioning the world to poverty. Now, what's happening is people are finding out that this green energy does not work. So here's two massive offshore wind farm developments off New Jersey. And neither one of them is going to succeed because the uh, wind farm developers, which is a, a company, a Dutch company, I believe, and uh, they just abandoned these two major wind turbine projects off the coast of New Jersey. Why? Are they realizing that the offshore projects have both increased costs because of interest rate rising and slowdowns because of, of adverse impacts related to the supply chain. They can't get parts. They can't build these things. And also, it's getting more expensive. So the Dutch companies are losing you know, $4 billion. These are losing projects, even with the massive subsidies. And so the chief executive of this Dutch company uh, said, he's extremely disappointed and announced that we are ceasing the development of Ocean Wind 1 and 2. The significant adverse developments from supply chain challenges 
uh, leading to delays in the project schedule, rising interest rates have led to this decision. Now, I also <clears throat> pulled out a paper yesterday. This paper is a, a, a one I'm following the author very closely of this paper. It's right here. It's called uh, Offshore Wind Cost Predictions and Cost Outcomes. It's written by Andrew Montfort, M-O-N-T-F-O-R-T, F-O-R-D. I quote him in my book on energy because he did an excellent analysis of Michael Mann's hockey stick and showed how the all the statistics were incorrect. And he's pointing out here again that the capital cost of these uh, wind turbine projects just don't work. So he's saying, um, uh, since the startling results of the 2017 contracts for difference auction, when offshore wind farms won bids, giving them the right, but not the obligation to sell electricity to the grid, uh, around it, it became commonplace to say that these wind farms were going to have great economics and it was going to be cheaper energy. Ahead of the recently published energy white paper, a series of news reports have repeated and reinforced these claims, including from the Department for Business, Energy, and Industrial uh, Strategy, et cetera, et cetera. So they're, they're hyping that these wind farms are going to be extremely profitable. They're going to be the backbone of renewable fuels. Uh, for the advocates of offshore wind to be insisting on the existence of a cost revolution is not surprising but it involves a considerable degree of chutzpah. In 2017, Hughes et al. pointed out that public data contained little evidence of a fall in the cost of offshore wind farms. Then in 2019, a review of financial accounts of UK offshore wind farms by uh, Elder C. Williams et al. gave us the first systematic analysis of hard cost data for the sector. Results were a valuable antidote to the euphoria over the 2017 auction showing that wind farm costs were barely falling at all. A recent study by Hughes has updated and extended the elderly Williams results, concluding that the situation of anything is even worse than it was thought. While capital costs are at best operating costs uh, static, operating costs are rising quickly. Only financing costs are really falling. Well, that's also changed with interest rates increasing. So, what the realization is is that uh, the bubble, the the you know the the whole bloom is off this rose. There's no more people who are actually. Same thing happened under Obama when Solyndra, these big solar farm subsidized, went bankrupt. So renewable energy is not a viable idea economically. It's an ideological idea. It's ideologically based on the idea that you know hydrocarbon fuels emit carbon dioxide and that creates global warming. Carbon dioxide is a trace molecule in the atmosphere, 0.04%. Water vapor is by far, 70% of all greenhouse gases are water vapor. The left doesn't demonize water vapor because hydrocarbon fuels don't emit it. And there is no evidence really of global warming. Um, Chris, if you'll show, we have um, queued up here there's an article on Climate Depot today, which talks about how the Arctic ice is growing. It's growing rapidly. So it's also close, it's growing so fast, it's closing the northern sea route for shipping. Okay, so we hear all this about the, if, if right there, that one, stop right there, Chris, because that, you'll see how that dynamic graph shows how the Arctic ice has expanded blocking off the sea lanes that are shipping routes. Now, that refutes solidly the evidence that is being hypothecated as basically lies by the green left that the Arctic ice is shrinking. It's not. It's growing. But you won't find this reported in the mainstream media. They'll be reporting that it was an extremely hot summer. It was historically the hottest summer ever. It wasn't. We had hotter summers in the 1930s, but that won't be reported. Uh, what we're finding is we're dealing in a series of end time scenarios here. The rise of hate, uh, the rise of anti Semitism in the world, which is probably 
not been this intense since the 1930s. We're finding that Israel is now realizing that it is its survival is on the table. Whether or not Israel will survive is a question that's being placed in debate today. The United States is already strained. We've got two aircraft carrier groups operating in the Mediterranean. In today's warfare, these are just two sitting duck targets for Iranian missiles. You know, aircraft carriers, as mighty as they are, and as powerful as they've been in previous combat, certainly through World War II, or through Korea, through Vietnam, the aircraft carriers were mighty weapons. Today, they're vulnerable. Given modern technology, which makes warfare like a video game, these carriers are just big sitting duck targets. And they're not able to be defended against incoming missiles as much as we might try. Uh, again, the vulnerability of these weapon systems make them obsolete. Think about the aircraft carriers being obsolete. Now, we don't have dry docks big enough right now to, to service an aircraft carrier of the size that are being manufactured. The debate is, should we build more dry docks? Well, you might be building a dry dock for a Model T. In other words, aircraft carriers could be antiquated in modern warfare. Surface ships are just too vulnerable. And the idea that you're going to send an armada of ships in an ocean like the Pacific, you'll, we're talking about Taiwan and China, Pacific is twice as large as the Atlantic. Uh, if you've ever been on a ship in an ocean, you're pretty lonely. You don't see any other ships around, even though there's plenty of ships in the ocean. It's just enormous. You know, people don't have a, a concept in terms of human scale of the magnitude or size of the earth. It, it's not all like New York City crowded and dense. There's a lot of areas unpopulated, and it's like when you fly in an airplane. There's a lot of airplanes in the sky, but it's pretty rare ever to see another one passing you or, or nearby, even though the air is filled with airplanes. And that's not just because they're flying in lanes and separated by air traffic control. It's just that the amount of space is so enormous. And an airplane, an airplane the size of you know a, a big, modern, not a 707, but a modern jet like they're, like they're flying these days you know the 767 777 787s uh, who knows what they're, these are enormous planes but in the sky they're they're miniature uh we don't appreciate the size of earth or the magnitude of the forces that would be required to produce global changes the size of the forces are like currents in the ocean the sun and the intensity of the sun our orbit, whether we're in a circular orbit or a more elliptical orbit, the more elliptical orbits when we have ice ages, about every 100,000 years. And it won't matter how much carbon dioxide there is in the Earth, we'll still have an ice age. Chris, would you like to comment? Well, it's another one of those climate change myths debunked. Hey, aren't, aren't the polar ice camps supposed to have been uh, uh, pools of water by now? And right. all the it's polar gone. bears were, were, should have been drowned already and, and we should have taken them in. To, to the country by now it's it, this is basically a religion and and not and one of those more, more less of a religion more of a cult it's it's like these people will believe anything that comes out of their leaders mouths whenever they these predictions are become false they just wait for the next one and they believe it they try to cram it down everybody else's throat and to the point where uh, they 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 the facts have the, they're they're bereft in facts, so they have to equate anybody who challenges them to those who deny the Holocaust by calling us climate change deniers. There's a, there's a there's a word that they add to this. So whenever somebody on the left is lying about something, they'll either add the suffix phobia to a word to make you uh, to kind of quiet you, or they're going to call you a denier, and that's what's happening now. Well, and also the uh, the the left is totalitarian. They, they don't want dissent. They don't want discussion. They, they don't want to educate people so they can reason on their own. Uh -huh. They want groupthink. Right. Okay. The extreme right wants limited government or no government. The extreme right is afraid of government. The extreme left can't have enough government. <laughs> it, they, and yet they call, they say, well, you know, it's, 
uh, they want to say Hitler and it's Hitler was a leftist, right? National Socialism it was the National Socialist Party, and uh, it was a workers' party that was National Socialism, which is not on the right. And the totalitarianism of Hitler, the totalitarianism of Stalin or Mao, all derive from their de determination to rule through ideology. Through and ideology is based upon barely thought through issues that are emotionally powerful. Like we got to, the Jews are responsible for Germany losing World War II. Nonsense. The Jews fought for Germany. If Germany had not gone after the Jews in the Holocaust, Hitler probably would have had the atomic bomb. Because a lot of those scientists who fled Europe under Hitler came to the United States and were involved in the atomic bomb process. Without the Jewish scientists, we probably wouldn't have had an atomic bomb. And so therefore, this insane idea that we've got to round up and kill all the Jews diverted massive military force, took a lot of energy and resources to get the Jews into concentration camps and start liquidating them. It was insanity. Those Jews would have fought for Germany had Hitler not been insane. But the left is insane. The ideas they produce are insanity. And I've demonstrated that again. I'm writing books like crazy to try to get these ideas out there. The second volume of my trilogy is now published. This is the truth about neo-Marxism, cultural Maoism, and anarchy. And it, it's, an, I, I think, an important book because it demonstrates the mindset, the dark, evil ideology that has descended over America, which is the, you know, this arc of this Hegelian dialectic, uh, which it, it culminates only in negation with millions annihilated in the, night, the nightmare. It's the apocalypse of postmodernist democratic socialism and it's going to be it's extremely important to read this book and it my first volume which was the truth about energy global warming climate change says the left lies this is all nonsense the next book says this is why they lie because they have an ideology that they can imagine this utopia John Lennon. Let's um, you talk about. We, let's reimagine police. <laughs> let's reimagine prisons. That all comes out of postmodernism, where the idea is there's no, there's only subjective reality. So therefore, we can create verbally this utopia, which is you know no racism and no antagonisms, and we have no borders and we have no God. John Lennon. Let's imagine a world. Without God, wouldn't this be wonderful? We wouldn't have any religious wars. Let's imagine a world without boundaries. Wouldn't it be wonderful? No nation states to go to war with, with each other. It's all fantasy. We'd be better off imagining a world without John Lennon because these ideas are powerful ideas, but they are evil in their destructiveness. I'm going to cover that next. Chris, do you want to comment? Again, have you ever noticed that these meet noble causes like uh I don't know, world peace or or black lives matter or something else. these neat little slogans and neat little organizations start out with a with a nice intent but then they're, they always seem to be co-opted by the far left the socialist the marxist types yet those who uh follow in the beginning and and kind of only don't look past the slogans and the titles still follow this unwittingly unwittingly pushing forth socialist ideology which winds up being destructive and de generally for the for the vast majority of times goes totally against the intention or what the meaning of the title of uh or, or the intention of the beginning uh, of of such movements are uh, because any any opposition becomes racist any opposition becomes anti whatever this or that and anti-opposition becomes uh well basically uh demonized or evil at, at its heart, uh, these ideologies start by removing God. Right. And uh, as soon as there's no God, there's no family, there's no values. Uh, the next story I wanted to cover is this, this uh, homelessness in London, which is an all-time high. They call it rough sleeping. Oh, yes. And so there you can see pictures of the, you know, the tent people. Okay, now why is this happening? Well, because uh, London, like many of the countries in Europe, brought in all these immigrants, these people, 
largely Muslim, fleeing the Middle East, and all the wars we've had in the Middle East, going back to Afghanistan and Iraq and all the in Syria. And they don't assimilate into the population. They're there seeking asylum. And London has put them into hotels, just like they've done in New York. The homelessness now occupy three or four major hotels in New York City, and they bring with them crime. Well, what happens is, as the uh, UK government gets overwhelmed, so the influx of homeless foreign nationals is largely being blamed on the UK government, which is accused of amending asylum laws to push people out of taxpayer-funded accommodation more quickly and reduce the substantial asylum backlog in the country. There's so many they can't handle them. They're pushing them out onto the streets because there's new ones coming more. And there'll be more coming with the war going on right now with Israel and Hamas. And these people need a place to go to because they're being driven from their homes. And they go to Europe on the UK. And they're coming through the southern border again. I think we have a caravan of another 7,000 people crossing the border. Now, I'm strongly in favor of immigration. I think Spanish immigration in the United States is probably the revival of the United States. These Spanish people still believe in God and family. They haven't been indoctrinated into neo-Marxism yet by the schools. So, but the uncontrolled, unregulated immigration allows criminals to come in, and the corruption is massive. There's stories out again today about the Biden crime family and how they were organizing their money laundering scheme to take in money from you know, oligarchs in, uh, in Ukraine you know, with Hunter Biden on the board of Burisma and then China and other places. I mean, the Biden administration is riddled at the top with the Biden family corruption and the Justice Department does nothing about it. Our government has been corrupt and it's easier to spend money. And some of the money which given in foreign aid, in fact, I, I've, I've written about this extensively that Biden you know, the whole group of foreign aid that's sent overseas or weapons that are sent overseas or billions of dollars sent overseas, we don't account for it. And a lot of that ends up getting stolen. In fact, it's just free cash. And, and we're giving money away in such quantities that it's almost impossible to account for it. It's, it's just an invitation to steal. Okay, now the next story, and all these do fit together today. Uh, I want to cover the several things on international developments. Uh, Putin has revoked the, ne the nuclear test ban treaty. Now that is a treaty that was signed, I believe, in 1996, and we stopped doing atmospheric tests. Jack Kennedy was the first to want to get into this, and he started arms negotiations, arms reduction, and test ban treaty negotiations with Russia just before he was assassinated. In fact, I think that one of the reasons Kennedy was assassinated was because he wanted to work with Khrushchev and our military industrial complex, which is now making billions of dollars off the war in Ukraine and Israel. They're getting their payday, just like during the pandemic, the drug companies got their pandemic, their, their payday. But these are more signs of end days. The world is edging toward nuclear war. And it could happen any time with an escalation of the violence in with Israel. It could also happen if we ship new weapons to Ukraine and Russia decides they've had enough. If, is, if Israel decides to attack Tehran by air or missiles, that's going to be a game changer just as if Russia decides to attack Kiev in a serious fashion. It'd be a game changer. And the world is on the brink of going into a credit crisis, and it will be thrown into a deep recession here in the near future. Okay, uh, finally, a Connecticut judge threw out election results, a primary election in Connecticut on the basis of, a, of extensive Democratic Party voter fraud. So this judge decided that the Democratic primary election 
which was won by the incumbent mayor, Joe uh, Garam, was uh, ruined by ballot, ballot harvesting and ballot fraud, violations of state law that he said were shocking. So after two weeks of evidentiary hearings, uh, this the uh, Judge William Clark ordered a new Democratic primary based on 180 pieces of evidence presented by legal counsel. In a 37-page ruling, Clark said video footage uh, was particularly alarming. He said that he was shocked when he saw in the video clips was evidence uh, that the, there was ballot stuffing, um, ballot fraud of various kinds, and that the Democratic Party was involved in it at the highest levels in Connecticut. He was shocked by an 18-minute video that appeared to show 12 instances of uh, ballots being depositing stacks of ballots or handing ballots to others from behind the reception desk and having them go stuff these uh, you know, ballot boxes which are placed around the city. Uh, this is a this is important evidence because we finally have a judge talking about in Connecticut this primary election having voter fraud and validating that what we see and looks like voter fraud in this election in Connecticut was voter fraud and with the judge's decision makes it legitimate to talk about it. Um, the situation worldwide looks grim. I think there is hope because we're finally realizing that neo-Marxism is a fraud. We're realizing renewable energy is a hoax. Uh, the American people, once it comes to suffering economically, are not going to care about gender identity issues. If you can't, if you can't pay your mortgage or you can't pay your car payment, you know, are you really going to worry about sex change operations? You know, we're funding the wrong things. We're funding insanity. And essentially, we're going to judge the woke by the results of what they create. Judge the tree by the fruit of the tree. It's biblical. And the fruit of this tree is rotten. And it has to be, we have to deal, deal with this one way or the other. And the way, I always say in the end, God always wins. God will win here too. I'm going to wrap it up. God will win here too. Uh, it, I know the situation looks grim. Every, everywhere you look, we've got wars. We've got the four horsemen of the apocalypse look like they're riding. Pestilence, death, famine. Africa, people are starving. They don't have cheap energy. And if we go this green renewable route, we're only going to have more expensive energy. And more people will die of poverty. And again, this whole movement on the left is one of depopulation. Uh, the Bible gives us a solution to it, which is Second Chronicles 7.14, where God instructs us that if we get on our knees and beg forgiveness, we've taken God out for taking out of the schools, out of our hearts, out of the public squares. God needs to be in the center of moral education, allowing babies to be chopped apart in the womb. These are against God's law, these actions. If we atone for this, God will heal our prayer and heal the land. Now, we're going to have a judgment of God, and it's not going to be, I think, at this point, avoidable. We're in the middle of it being brought down upon us, and it will get worse. But I, I, I can't imagine that God created the human race to fail. I think within the human race is a great uncertainty inside each of us that God exists and that we're here for a purpose, that this is not just but when we start thinking we can rule here, we can make it perfect, we can extend life, we can e extend our human existence and enhance it with machines, we begin to play, be, play God, that's when we are actually playing Satan's tune. Garden of Eden, just eat the fruit, you'll know what God knows, you'll make this per place perfect. God couldn't make it perfect, that's why he doesn't want you eating the fruit. Complete lie. God... The, the purpose of this place is to serve God. If you don't do it, you are violating not only human nature, but God's law. And this Dr. Jerome Corsi, I think we will get through this, 
And I think it's going to be very difficult. And I encourage everyone to join me in the spirit of 2 Chronicles 7.14. Uh, this is thetruthcentral.com. We're doing podcasts every weekday. I'm about to start a sub stack. And um, we will be back tomorrow. Uh, thank you for joining us. The Truth Central, we're on a lot of stations. We're on Rumble. We're on Cloud Hub. Take the upper right-hand corner of the website, thetruthcentral.com. You'll see all the sites we're on. And uh, we encourage you to spread the word. Call Swiss America to um, get a copy of this book and talk to them about gold. The number is 1-800-519-6268. 1-100-519-6268. Get your free book and talk to them about gold. This is Dr. Jerome Corsi. Thank you for joining us today. God bless.